Good evening, dear colleagues. Welcome to this live ASCVI webinar on COVID-19. I am Dr. Hatem Suleiman and I work as a cardiothoracic intensivist in London, UK. And I have a great pleasure of being joined today uh, by my dear colleague, Dr. Luna Gargani, a cardiologist from the Institute of Clinical Physiology, National Research Council in Pisa, Italy. The topic of today's webinar will be focused around how to use and interpret lung ultrasound in COVID-19. This session is an interactive one, and we do strongly recommend you and encourage you to actively participate by sending your questions and comments at any time during the webinar through the chat section in front of you. We also recommend for the best learning experience that you participate actively in an online assessment uh, questions that we are going to send you uh, across the webinar. And without further ado, I will start with a brief introduction. I have no disclosures and the webinar learning outcomes will be to discuss how to perform a systematic uh, long ultrasound, uh, how to identify the important sonographic signs in COVID-19 patients, what are the relevant uh, studies uh, in this topic and how to explain uh, the role of lung ultrasound uh, in terms of affection of patient management. So we are all witnessing this huge global healthcare uh, and public health challenge, the COVID-19 pandemic. And lung ultrasound has been uh, practiced in many centers around the world and was found useful for assessment, follow-up and helping the clinical decision-making. It was also found to have high sensitivity in detecting several plural and parenchymal pathologies. And a bit of a historical note on the use of ultrasound in the lungs. This is from Dr. Harrison textbook of internal medicine. And in the 1990s, it was said that the lung is not suitable for ultrasound, but this has proven to be wrong. And this has been challenged by several seminal papers which were published uh, later on, and it was trying to analyze the different artifacts generated in the lungs when we scan the lungs by ultrasound. So what are the principles of lung ultrasound? We do know that ultrasound is not transmitted through aerated tissue. We also do know that the normal parenchyma is not visible. Our interface between the pleura and the lung is the interface which reflects the ultrasound, and our acoustic window is the intercostal space. So there are plenty of advantages of ultrasound in general, and especially uh, in COVID-19. We do know that ultrasound is safer because it has less radiation. It also reduces the healthcare professional's exposure by reducing the number of personnel required to scan the patient as compared to the CT and moving the patient outside his bed space. It is repeatable, so it is useful for monitoring the patient progress. It is lower in cost portable, useful at the point of care, and it is rapid and sensitive for diagnosis of pneumonia. And this is uh, an illustration to show you what is the value of lung ultrasound to try to understand how to assess the degrees of aeration and the loss of aeration in the lungs. From the top of the screen here, we can see the normal aeration where we see these horizontal mirror-shaped artifacts of the pleural line, which reflects the normal aeration of the lung. And when we start to see reduction of aeration due to increase in the extravascular lung water, we start to see these vertical-like comet tails, which initially reduces the, uh, the pattern or changes the pattern to, into a black and white. And when it's more abundant and more confluent, it becomes curtain-like across the screen and changes the pattern into white pattern and the least degree of aeration is when the lung air is transformed into tissue which is the development of consolidation and we can see here how the progression of aeration and the loss of aeration happens which can give us an idea about the utility of this in monitoring our uh, critically ill patients with COVID-19 and this is an example to show you briefly how to uh, assess the changes in the lungs as compared to the CT scan. This is a normal scan of a patient as compared to the presence of these horizontal lines, mirror shape artifacts of the pleural line. And when we analyze a patient with COVID-19 in the early stage, we start to see the thickening of the interlobular septa on the CT, which reflects 
by the development of these vertical line comet tails, the B lines, and with more involvement of the lungs and more extravascular lung water, you start to see the curtain-like development of these B lines, uh, an irregularity and uh, thickening of the pleural line, which represents the ground glass appearance peripherally at the chest CT. And in more advanced stages of COVID-19, we will see more extensive areas of uh, ground glass opacification and quite thickened and irregular pleural line and hypodense areas underneath the pleura representing subpleural consolidation. And in extreme forms of uh, ARDS, we see complete loss of aeration and the lung tissue or the lung will be transformed into a tissue-like structure um, which is described as hepatization. Although this is not typical of COVID-19 patient, but it can happen because we are witnessing different phenotypes uh, of this disease. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Gargani, to give us her presentation. Lorna. Okay, thank you, Hatem. Good afternoon to everybody. This is my disclosure. Okay, so in the next 20 minutes or so, we will see how to do a lung ultrasound exam and what to look for in COVID patients, as well as the clinical integration and the pitfalls. So first of all, and I'd like to stress this very much, lung ultrasound in COVID is an evolving knowledge. We have no clear data. We have no robust analysis of what we have seen in the last few weeks. So the only way at the moment is to have an empirical approach that is based on our previous experience, but in different disease. But we have to take into account that we have to adapt and change rapidly our way of thinking. So let's start with some technical hints. Uh, the convex probe is the most universal probe for lung ultrasound and is the most universal probe also in COVID patients. The linear probe allows a better definition of the pleural line and the subpleural space, but the convex probe is absolutely enough to visualize everything that is needed in this patient. Then the preset. If your machine has a lung preset, use it. Otherwise, you can use the abdominal preset. And when you put the probe on the chest, you should scan each point for the duration of at least one complete respiratory cycle and possibly for five, six seconds. So the position of the probe. The probe can be positioned in either a longitudinal matter, which is perpendicular to the ribs. So you can visualize the so-called butt sign or transverse, which is parallel to the ribs. Both are fine. Personally, I usually scan transverse to avoid the interference of the ribs, but you may also decide to scan longitudinally and then you may switch to transverse when you see some alterations. So the first step is to visualize the pleural line and the lung sliding, which is indicated in this video by the green arrows. It is important not to confuse the pleural line with other hyperechoic lines, as in this case here. So you can see this line is not moving, is not sliding. It is probably a muscular fascia. And the real pleural line is here underneath, indicated by the green arrow, not clearly visible. So this is the first very important step of our exam. Then the depth. The depth should be about 8-10 centimeters, a bit less if you have lean patients and a bit more if you have obese patients. The gain, the gain should be adjusted in order to optimize the visualization of the pleural line. And also the focus should be positioned at the level of the pleural line. So the aim is to visualize the pleural line and the lung sliding very well. Okay, so for the scanning scheme, again, we don't know at the moment which is the best scanning scheme in COVID patients. So what we can do is to rely on previously standardized protocols, 
such as this scheme, which is based on the one proposed almost 10 years ago by the Lebumat and his group. And uh, this is a scheme that has been used especially in ICQ patients. But we have, again, to remind that these applications and these approaches have been validated in different conditions than in COVID patients. But briefly, we have the right and left hemithorax divided into the anterior, lateral, posterolateral, and posterior areas based on the anatomical lines parasternal, anterior axillary, posterior axillary, linea scapularis, and paravertebral. All these regions uh, are then divided into upper and lower parts. And of course, if the posterior thorax is not accessible, the areas seven and eight of both the right and left hemithoraxes will be discarded. But whenever possible, the posterior thorax should be evaluated because this is where the lesions are often present, especially in the early phases. And if your patient cannot sit, the posterolateral chest is usually accessible, even in ventilated patients, by tilting the patients a bit on their side. Of course, if on the other way, the patient is pronated, it is the anterior chest that cannot be scanned. So again, there are other scanning schemes, there are other approaches. This one is a good balance between being comprehensive and quick. And anyway, please remind that independently of the scheme we are using, we have to scan all the chest because this is a patchy condition. Okay, so what to look for? Again, we can use a previously validated score which refers back to the concept of the densitometer that Hatham uh, briefly explained before with some slight modification. And we assign a score of zero when we have no B lines or fewer than three B lines, as in these cases. Then we give a score of one in the presence of at least three B lines, or if we have coalescent B lines, but covering less than 50% of the screen. And we can also add the information about the presence of subpleural alterations. So in this case, we don't have clear subpleural alterations, but we may have also a score of one with clear subpleural alteration. Okay, and so we call these 1P. And we have to be very careful not to mistake Z lines for B lines. This is a technical note, but it can be very important, especially in your first examinations. So Z lines are also hyperechoic vertical artifacts, but without any specific pathological meaning. And compared to B lines, the Z lines are less defined, they're more blurred, they do not clearly move with the respiration and do not clearly start from the pleural line. So we have a multiple choice question now for the audience. You can see this video here. And we ask you, how many B lines do you see in this video? Three B lines, less than 50% of the screen of B lines, more than 50% of the screen of B lines, no B lines at all, or a white lung, so about 100% of the screen of B lines. Okay. All right, so we're waiting for the answers and maybe this is a, an opportunity to give you one of the questions that I received among the many questions, Luna. Um, mm. Several people are asking whether we can use the uh, cardiac phased array transducer for the lung ultrasound study. What do you think about that? Okay, this is an important question. So usually we can do lung ultrasound with a cardiac probe, especially as cardiologists, if we want to assess cardiogenic pulmonary edema. In this case, uh, I would say that if you don't have anything else, okay, you can even use your cardiac probe. But it would be better if you have a probe with a, a higher frequency, like a convex or a, at least a linear, because watching the subpleural space is very important in this patient and also the visualization of, of consolidation. So uh, if, you, if you don't have any other probe, 
use a cardiac probe instead of not doing the lung ultrasound. But if you can, uh, please try to use a convex or a linear. In this definitely. specific disease, it will be better. Yeah, definitely. So we can use the cardiac probe and uh, we've got the answers for this first uh, okay. question. So um, the majority of people, 54% answers, give answer to uh, choice B, which is less than 50% of B lines. 21% uh, chose option C, which is more than 50% of B lines, and 15% chose option A, three B lines. Okay, so uh, this means that it was good to put this question <laughs> because actually in this video, we don't see any B lines. So yeah. th this is uh, what I, I meant. Uh, these are all Z lines. If you see they're very blurred, yes. don't clearly start from the pleural line. It's a kind of background moving. So the B lines have to be much more hyperechoic, clearly starting from the from the pleural line. And I would say this is a very difficult video. These are the most confusing Z lines I had. And these are from a COVID patients who didn't have uh, pulmonary involvement. So uh, remember that B lines have to be very, very clear, clearly attached to the pleural line and moving with respiration, okay? So in this case, we have uh, all Z lines. Okay, so let's move on and... Uh, we give now a score of two. If we have B-lines covering more than 50% of the screen, in this case, without clear subpleural alteration. So you, you can see here B-lines clearly start from the pleural line. They're very bright and moving with, uh, with respiration. And again, we give a score of two P with the letter P if we have, again, B-lines covering more than 50% of the screen, but with clear subpleural alterations, as we can see here, and also here. And we give a score of three if we have a, a real consolidation, okay? So in this case, it is also useful to add some characteristics of the consolidation. For example, if you have a bronchogram, and of course, if you have pleural effusion, you should also uh, add in your report that you have pleural effusion. However, Pleural effusion is quite rare in these patients. I mean, a large pleural effusion is quite rare in this patient. We may see uh, small localized pleural effusion. So in the end, we sum up the scores of each area to get the final total score. Uh, the letters P are not counted in the score because this is more a qualitative information, but it is very useful to be reported also because in these patients, they are very frequent which is uh, compatible with the pathophysiology of the condition. But a very important message here is that you don't have to consider only the total score, which somehow reflects the degree of the aeration. So it is not so clear that in these patients, a higher score is so worse than a, a little less higher score, okay? So you have to consider also, and maybe this is even more important, the pattern, so if we have separated B-lines or coalescent B-lines or consolidations and the distribution. However, this scheme allows you to take all this information into account. So again, it's not only the duration, but it is also distribution and the kind of pattern that you have. And uh, in these patients, you will visualize very clear spared areas as in these examples. I would say that I've never seen such striking spurred areas as in patients with uh, uh, COVID, not even in classical ARDS, which is different from, from this condition. So spurred areas are quite, quite typical and they're very, very clear. Okay, so we have uh, a few minutes for a brief clinical case. Uh, we have uh, this guy, 40 years old, with no previous health issues. He had symptoms on set on the 9th of March, but he stayed home and auto-medicated. He didn't have any respiratory distress and no respiratory symptoms. But after more than a week, he had still fever and cough, so he went to the emergency department on the 17th of March, and uh, he was hospitalized. Um, his blood test showed uh, mild lymphopenia, which is quite typical of these patients, 
And then uh, when the results came over, he had high interleukin-6, high ferritin, high PCR. But his oxygen saturation was actually 98 in, uh, in normal breathing. So uh, while waiting for the swab results, he had a lung ultrasound examination in the emergency department. And uh, uh, these are the videos. As you can see, we have mainly B lines here. We have coalescent B lines with a pattern of more aeration, so less B lines here and more B lines here, coalescent B lines, and also a small subpleural consolidation here. And this guy also had a CT. This is uh, the CT. So you can see also the topographical distribution of lung ultrasound compared to the CT in this patient. You can do a comparison. So also the CT uh, shows, of course, clear abnormalities. It is not so bad situation, but frankly, positive. And this is the report that we did. So he had a total score of nine and only one error with a, a subpleural alteration. But after four days, uh, the patient had a sudden deterioration. He went into respiratory distress with very high temperature. So lung ultrasound was soon repeated bedside because it was available. And this is the picture. And again, we have a topographical distribution of the abnormalities, and we can see that there is a, a frankly worsened lung ultrasound pattern. So we have coalescent B lines where we had only a few B lines on the anterior parts, and we have much more consolidative pattern, especially in the posterior areas. We have a big consolidation here, a smaller subpleural consolidation, a consolidation here, and also quite a large consolidation. Uh, in this video. And uh, he also had a CT after that. And this is the, the CT on the 21st of March, the same day of the lung ultrasound. And, and you can see that uh, the, the pictures are quite consistent. Uh, so also the CT show consolidations and in the description also some uh, typical crazy paving areas. Okay, so you can also see the, again, not only the the aeration, but topographical distribution and different patterns between these two pictures. So the score now is 36. It was nine four days ago, but again, not, not consider only the aeration, consider only the qualitative pattern and the distribution. And if we go back to uh, the two phenotypes that uh, Luciano Gattinoni has recently described, the type L and type H, in this patient, Somehow, and I underline somehow, we have an example of the two patterns in two different moments of the disease in the same patient. Of course, this differentiation can be debated, but at least I'd like to show you that lung ultrasound can help you to distinguish these two main patterns. So one characterized mostly by confluent lines and the other characterized with a more consolidative pattern. And of course, the CT is the reference here, but whenever you cannot do a CT, you can go bedside and lung ultrasound can give you a visualization of the pattern of the aeration. And again, localization of the abnormalities, which can also have a clinical impact also to the side if proning or not the patient. So going back to our patient, he was treated quite conservatively. He was not intubated. He was uh, young and, and healthy, he was treated with high flonasal cannula. He had an autopronation and unfortunately he went well and recovered. Uh, so this is the city of uh, the 27th of March. So you can see that the patient, patient is pronated and there, is a, uh, there are still signs of involvement, but there is a significant improvement in the situation of our lung. Okay, so we have another uh, MCQ now for our audience. So what do you see in this video? Do you see the liver? Do you see the spleen, a pulmonary consolidation, a small subpleural consolidation, or a white lung? All right. Let's see what answers we will get on this. So 
So um, until we get the answers, of course, I'm getting a lot of questions here, Lona, from uh, people uh, watching us. And uh, one of the questions, um, I think one of the important ones, do we think that with lung ultrasound, we can differentiate between cardiogenic pulmonary edema and uh, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema? Okay, generally speaking, yes. Uh, of course, again, you don't do this differential diagnosis only based on the lung ultrasound, but the pictures are quite different. Uh, first of all, uh, you have uh, B lines with a normal appearance of the pleural line in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and you have B lines with uh, an appearance of the pleural line that is irregular. It's not the real pleural line to be irregular, but it is the subpleural space that gives this appearance of irregular pleural line, and we can see this subpleural alteration. So that is quite typical of the non-cardiogenic edema. And also the distribution is very different. So cardiogenic edema has a gravity-related distribution because water goes down, and it is very... Um, it is more uniform, whereas the non-cardiogenic edema is more patchy. And it's patchy both in the whole chest, and it is patchy also in the single video. So when we mention the spared area, these are areas where you can have many B lines just close to an area, complete, aerated. And you wouldn't see these in the cardiogenic edema. Yep. So, yes. And, uh, of course, this is a situation which is non-cardiogenic, so you wouldn't find all the typical cardiogenic features. Of course, yeah. there can be problems if you have both conditions. Yeah, that, that would be the tricky situation, really. Overlapping it situation. It's possible, of course. Okay. All right, so we got the answers to this, uh, this question, and the majority of people gave uh, their um, answer to uh, option number three, which is a pulmonary consolidation. 70% answered a pulmonary consolidation. Okay, which is the, the right uh, okay. answer, okay? So it's not the liver, it's not the spleen. Uh, again, in the very beginning, you may misunderstand the abdominal organs for a, for a consolidation, but I see our audience is already quite skilled, and this is a, yeah. a large consolidation, which we can find in these patients. So not only the small subpleural, but also larger consolidations, especially in the later stages of, uh, of the disease. And then we like the lung a lot, of course, but we don't have to forget the heart. Uh, this is um, an example of a real clinical scenario of a COVID patient with an acute right ventricular dysfunction. So remember that you have to check for the left and the right heart. Patients may have myocarditis, patients may have acute core pulmonale. So it, especially in high-risk patients, it is always important always to check the heart. And also the diaphragm can be useful. Uh, ultrasound can assess the diaphragmatic function and the integration of the heart, lung and diaphragm can be useful again, especially to titrate uh, mechanical ventilation and timing of weaning. Of course, we don't have time to go into details now, but just to mention that there are other tools uh, uh, apart from, from the lung that we can use. Okay, so the most important issue now, the clinical, integration. And uh, uh, of course, the lung ultrasound can be useful at many steps in the management of COVID patients. But we must be aware that at the moment, we unfortunately don't have magic numbers. We don't have cutoffs or definite flowcharts to use. So we have some indications, very useful indications, but no definite answer to all the questions we have in this patient. And based on the experience of these weeks, we can say the lung ultrasound can be useful for the diagnosis, especially because it is more sensitive than chest X-ray. And it seems to be a great tool also to be implemented in home monitoring. In patients hospitalized, so we have a different subset of patients, the lung ultrasound picture can help you to stratify the risk. And it seems that it is especially the negative predictive value here that can help in identifying a population at low risk for further deterioration. And the other point is that lung ultrasound changes appear quite early and often earlier than respiratory deterioration. There is an imaging 
uh, and function disconnection here because uh, the, the imaging with the lung ultrasound is very early. So if it is feasible, it is reasonable to follow up these patients even when it seems that they are going fine. And then we have the big chapter of the monitoring and titration for response to drug, monitoring the respiratory support, choosing the patient position and the time of weaning. But in all these situations, there are two main points to remember. First of all, always consider the distance from symptoms onset. This is important because a negative lung ultrasound a few days after symptoms onset has a different value than a negative lung ultrasound many days after symptoms onset. And of course, always integrate lung ultrasound with the overall picture and other tests. This is absolutely crucial to do. Pitfalls, there are many pitfalls and gray areas. Uh, first of all, although we always say the lung ultrasound is easy, this is not unfortunately an exam for novice sonographers. So, so it's not a basic lung ultrasound here. Also because we have a patchy pattern. So if you're not skilled, you risk to miss some alterations, especially in the early phases. Then there is a risk of spreading the infection, although it is lower than for other imaging tests. And so you should do an exam only if you think that the results can impact your management. And of course, we are working in a very stressful environment with all the individual protection, and this doesn't help at all to make this exam. So the final message is, as always, that the probe is powerful, is very informative, but cannot replace your medical knowledge, your clinical judgment and your experience. So please use your brain, not only the probe. And you may find online a lot of material. Here we have the links to two tutorials that Hatham and I prepared a few days ago. And I could not end my presentation without a huge thanks to the colleagues of the Emergency Medicine Department of Pisa University Hospital and all the colleagues and the healthcare personnel who are working with extreme dedication and self-denial to assist this patient in this very dramatic situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Luna, uh, for your uh, presentation. And uh, now I would uh, like to, um, to start the next uh, part of this uh, presentation. And I will give a brief overview of the important literature that was published lately on the role of imaging, uh, especially lung ultrasound in COVID-19 patients. So starting with CT, uh, chest CT, we know that CT is the gold standard in pneumonia. And uh, this is an interesting paper that was published uh, recently coming from China on 51 patients. And it tried to um, get a correlation between the sensitivity of the chest CT um, in comparison with the uh, blood PCR assay in patients with COVID-19 performed within three days, uh, which was quite an interesting and important comparison. And the result was showing a much higher sensitivity for the CT, uh, almost 98% in COVID-19 patients as compared to only 71% for the PCR. So this gives us a good insight into the importance of imaging in detecting a quite a good number of patients which might have false negative results uh, when they are assessed for whether they have the COVID-19 uh, pneumonia or not. And we do know that we are in an era of um, more utilization of point of care ultrasound and even before we witnessed the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, lung ultrasound or ultrasound in general has been uh, uh, advocated as an extension of the bedside clinical examination and especially now with our trials to reduce uh, cross-contamination and risk of infection to the healthcare staff, we try to use less stethoscope and less mobilization of the patient from the bedside and we rely more on ultrasound to help us guiding our daily decision making. And this is another study uh, which was also uh, recently published in China on limited number of patients, about 20 patients, which was tried to correlate uh, between the results of the uh, CT chest with the lung ultrasound in such patients. 
And not surprisingly, a lot of the CT findings were closely correlated to the lung ultrasound findings. Thickening of the pleura was quite identical. The B lines, the confluent patchy B lines typical for COVID-19 were quite correlated to the typical peripheral ground glass shadowing on the chest CT. The subpleural consolidations were quite the same in both modalities of imaging. We do know that pleural effusion is rare in patients with COVID-19. We don't usually see large pleural effusion unless there is another cause for it. And this was not the only finding. They also found that we could assess the progression of the clinical uh, severity of COVID-19 with both the CT and the lung ultrasound by detecting the changes in aeration. So uh, I would like now to uh, take you to our second clinical case. And this is a gentleman who was quite uh, young and fit, actually, unfortunately, 33 years old uh, gentleman who had a high fever, shortness of breath, dry cough for three days, was having a hypoxemia on 100% oxygen, and uh, he was quite tired and having respiratory acidosis. With lymphopenia, high D-dimer, fibrinogen, and normal procalcitonin, typical of uh, what we see with COVID-19. The patient was attempted initially on non-invasive ventilation, but then he couldn't tolerate it and he was intubated and ventilated. And this is the initial chest x-ray of this patient, which uh, tell us that there are some peripheral uh, infiltration, but not really much from the x-ray, not more clinical information, not more uh, useful imaging information. That that's why we opted to do the lung ultrasound. And this is the initial lung ultrasound starting with the linear probe, looking at the pleura in high definition superficially. In his day one in the intensive care, on a PEEP of 12, 100% oxygen. And you can see here clearly the uh, subpleural consolidation, which are these hypodense areas underneath the pleural line. And the pleural line looks irregular and shaggy and thickened, uh, which is quite important clue to the peripheral extension of the viral pneumonia that he has. And when we moved to look into the parenchyma by, by our curvilinear probe, we saw this very typical, as Luna said, it's a very typical thing that we see very common in COVID-19. And we didn't see that often with other types of respiratory failure and ARDS, typical patchy alveolar edema. You see this shiny white curtain-like pattern. And in between that, you still see some spared areas of black aeration, including looking at the horizontal A lines, which are a reflection of the pleural line. So this is the initial uh, lung ultrasound of this gentleman. And when we applied our scoring, we saw a score of eight out of 18 on the right side and 10 out of 18 on the left with a number of subpleural alteration. But again, as Luna mentioned, we should not only rely on the aeration score, we should look qualitatively and the pattern of distribution of these findings and we, manage the patient, we started the treatment, he was sedated, paralyzed. We do see that these patients respond quite well to proning. So we had series of proning sessions every day. And this is his lung ultrasound on day eight of his stay in the intensive care. You can see, this is our linear probe and you can see the change in the pleural line. The pleural line is thinner than before and you don't see that big subpleural consolidations as before and you can correlate that to the change in his requirement in oxygenation his fi2 is down to 35 percent he's now on peep 7 and he is his oxygenation is quite better and when we looked into the lung parenchyma with the curvilinear probe we start to see a better pattern of aeration we have less confluent B lines, it is less white, and we start to see the normal black appearance of these horizontal mirror-shaped artifacts, the A lines. We still do, some, do see some B lines, which is not uncommon. B lines can remain even after recovery for some time, but they are not significant and they are not uh, as bad as his initial condition. And when we repeated the scoring as a way of monitoring the progression of aeration, we saw a significant drop in the aeration score which reflects a better aeration on the right side down to three from 18 and on the left side down to four from 18 with also reduction in the number of subpleural alterations. And our patient 
uh, was extubated at day 10 and he was stepped down to the ward at day 12 and he went home safely at day 16. So this is our uh, uh, first question for you um, uh, from this case. Which of the following is less concomitant with COVID-19 pneumonia? Bilateral symmetrical B-lines, subpleural consolidation, patchy confluent B-lines, pleural effusion, A and D, B and C. We're waiting for your answers. So uh, one question, Luna, I got a question um, repeatedly actually. People are asking how long experience do you need to be able to uh, perform lung ultrasound? So oh, very important question. Uh, I would say again, here it depends on what you have to search for. Uh, if you only, if you are a cardiologist and you just have to use lung ultrasound to detect cardiogenic pulmonary edema, the experience you need is a bit uh, shorter because you don't have all the spectrum of alterations. Uh, in this case, uh, I would say, yes, it, it is not a basic lung ultrasound. We can refer, because again, we don't have any other experience or data, to a paper published uh, a couple of years ago by the group of Jean-Jacques Ruby. And uh, uh, they saw that uh, to do a correct scoring in the way we have shown before, you need uh, 25 supervised examinations to do with someone who is expert in lung ultrasound. Uh, so this could be uh, a good idea of what, what you may need. Uh, th this is not an exam that you can learn in a couple of hours of lung ultrasound training. Of course, we don't want to discourage anyone. We have to learn lung ultrasound this is a, a good occasion, but you cannot just go and start scanning patients after a very, very small training. You need a little bit of time with someone who can supervise Supervision, you. Definitely. Great. And, and if you don't feel confident, uh, just uh, wait and, yes, uh, and do definitely. something else. Yeah. You should do it correctly. That's, that's the main target. Yeah. It's, uh, it, these are critical patients. We, we cannot yes. make mistakes. Yeah. Definitely. But it's well, easier than other techniques, of course. It is, it definitely is always easy. the yes. same. And it's easier than echocardiography. Yes, of course. Even in COVID. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we got answers to our question and uh, we seem like we have a quite clever uh, um, and many skilled uh, audience. We, the majority answered correctly, 55% gave uh, to choice E, which is A and D, which is correct. The less concomitant features with COVID-19 are bilateral symmetrical B-lines and pleural effusion. We do know that COVID-19 does not commonly cause large pleural effusion and it does cause patchy asymmetrical B-lines. So we will move to the, quickly to the clinical benefits and Luna already mentioned that uh, just to stress on the importance of lung ultrasound to help us in guiding our clinical decision making in the intensive care. It can help us monitoring the recruitment of our patients with post pressure ventilation. It gives us a tool to monitor the response to proning and helping weaning from mechanical ventilation especially if we will integrate diaphragmatic ultrasound and echocardiography as well. It showed a strong correlation with the CT scan, especially for the peripheral uh, abnormalities, earlier detection of pleural pathologies than chest X-ray. And interestingly, this has been also found to be happening before hypoxemia develops in some experimental models of ARDS. And it's useful triaging patients as some centers already started putting a triaging protocols for patients with COVID-19 depend, depending on the lung ultrasound findings and the clinical manifestation and then putting a clinical decision making whether they can be managed uh, at home on an outpatient base or admit to the hospital or managed in the intensive care. And it's useful consequently for risk stratification, prognostication and definitely it would help as a monitoring tool for assessing disease progression. And now we come to our second question, which is a second 65 years old lady with fever, cough and shortness of breath diagnosed as COVID-19. And we would like to ask you which statement best explains the below lung ultrasound. Is it a normal finding, a lower consolidation, a pneumothorax, subpleural consolidation or pleural effusion? We probably won't have uh, much time for waiting, so we will get the answer 
very quickly. And this could also answer many of the questions that I received uh, um, in the chat uh, box. So we are at the moment having a majority going to subplural consolidation, which is the correct answer. And uh, many people were asking me on the chat, what is the subplural alteration? This is what we can see when we look at the plural with the linear probe, the irregularity of the plural and the black shadow underneath the plural, which is interrupting the plural itself. This is typical of subplural consolidation. So uh, this is a flow chart which is released lately by the Intensive Care Society of the UK. Actually, early in the uh, development of the COVID-19 pandemic, and it tried to get us into a, a management helping tool to try to give us uh, a way to categorize what type of management will be suitable according to the uh, predominant pattern of lung ultrasound. So according to this protocol, we if we have a predominant B lines pattern, these patients will probably be a PEEP responder. And if we have a predominant consolidation or atelectasis, these patients would be predominantly prone responder. So this is a protocol which is reliable for ARDS. And uh, we learned on the way in our experience with COVID-19 that these patients do not have the typical or classical ARDS. They have a different type of respiratory failure, which causes a moderate degree of loss of aeration and extensive uh, increase in the extravascular lung water. So although they don't have predominant lower consolidation, but we know that they do respond very well to proning. And some theories were developed on that, including redistribution of perfusion with proning. And also it could be attributed to the development of microatelectasis. And we also knew that these patients despite being hypoxic, they don't usually have reduction of their compliance. And this is the phenotype that Luna showed in Gattinoni's paper. The L phenotype, the predominant phenotype of COVID-19, usually have a preserved lung compliance. And that's why the, we should use PEEP cautiously in these patients. But the main thing is we can use lung ultrasound very well to assess the progression or resolution of their findings. And finally, it's important to integrate all the, um, imaging, uh, lung ultra the imaging ultrasound modalities that you have, scan the heart, scan the lungs, look at the neck veins, the IVC and the pleura and the diaphragm. And this will give you a better way into looking at your picture at your patient from different perspectives to give you the better, the best accurate clinical decision making. And of course, like any diagnostic modality, any uh, tool does not come without limitations. Lung ultrasound may miss pathologies deep within the lungs. Um, accuracy of it is uh, definitely influenced by training and experience, and we already discussed it. You need to be trained on it. And we do know that we have limited evidence-based data on this field. It's an evolving field in, uh, in imaging, and there is a potential for human transmission of COVID-19 with ultrasound. And this will take me to um, the item of how to maintain safety while you perform a lung ultrasound. You need to prepare your probe and machine uh, in a safe way. You need to protect yourself and you need to clean the equipment thoroughly after the study. Preparation of the probe. Uh, this is from the latest recommendations from the ASCVI on precautions, indications, and protection of patients and healthcare professionals in COVID-19. And the recommendation is to use handheld devices in your unit if it's available. And if it's not available, we should try to, to assign a dedicated ultrasound machine in our red zone in the COVID area. You should protect yourself, you protect the ultrasound probe with glove and cover, not essentially sterile, and applying ultrasound gel below and above the cover. And of course, you need to protect yourself by the standard PPE, mask, gown, gloves, eye shield, and head cover. And never forget after the study to clean the probe, the machine, including the cables, both with external gloves and after removing the gloves, and always remember to refer to your manufacturer's guidance on the preferred cleaning and disinfection products which are compatible with your probe. And now we will have um, about um, less than 10 minutes for uh, answering your questions. And 
let me start by the first question. So most of the question we got were revolving around whether we can use lung ultrasound uh, to monitor COVID-19 patients. And I think we already answered that in our webinars so far. Yes, we definitely can use it to monitor our COVID-19 patients in putting this in the clinical context. And um, uh, we have another question here about um, the differences between consolidation and atelectasis. Are we able to differentiate between consolidation and atelectasis with lung ultrasound, Luna? What do you think? Yeah, this is um, a terminology issue. So if, if when you say atelectasis, if you mean compression atelectasis, uh, of course, lung ultrasound can help you to distinguish the compression atelectasis from other consolidations, because in that case, you should see a large pleural effusion able to physically compress the parenchyma. If you mean an obstructive atelectasis, again, lung ultrasound can help you to differentiate an obstructive atelectasis from a consolidation, because uh, in that case, if you have a, a obstructive atelectasis, you don't see the bronchogram, the air bronchogram, because your um, airways are closed and so you don't have the visualization of the air as white tree-like appearance into the consolidations. So there are some imaging hints to help you with that. Again, it's not only lung ultrasound, but there are uh, imaging tools to, to help you with, uh, to orientate this differentiation. Great. And um, another question is about um, uh, the utilization of uh, lung ultrasound in uh, the unit. How often do we do lung ultrasound in our unit for mm -hmm. our COVID-19 patients? This is very difficult to answer because yeah. uh, we have to find a balance between not doing useless examination, which in this case are not only potentially useless, but also potentially risky, yes. and avoiding the, the clinical benefit of lung ultrasound. So I, I would say, and uh, with, with a lot of caution and after having seen many patients and having spoken with a lot of colleagues, that when you have a hospitalized patient with clear pulmonary involvement, having a daily lung ultrasound, even if the patient seems stable, seems a good choice to do because the lung ultrasound is much earlier than respiratory deterioration. We know that some of these patients, and my clinical case was one of these examples, are quite fine and they seem going well, but then suddenly deteriorate and the deterioration is quicker in young patients. So, if you do a daily lung ultrasound, you may interfere this deterioration maybe like 12 hours before or 24 hours before mm -hmm. you start having huge symptoms and huge differences in the pulmonary function. So in this case, a daily monitoring, there are some protocols also suggesting twice a day, uh, twice a day is a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe daily is a good balance. Again, it's empirical. It's based on the experience of people we are talking in these days, trying to compare our, our knowledge and, and experience. But don't do lung ultrasound only when you have symptoms deterioration, because in that case, it, it, is, not so, it is not so useful. Great. So I totally agree, because it is, very, it is a very big area. And uh, um, predominantly, I also think that probably daily is the most reasonable, but we don't know really how often yeah. we should do it, depending on the clinical context and the clinical severity of the patient. And um, we're getting some questions as well about uh, something we mentioned. What is the definition of spirit areas? We know that the spirit areas are the areas of aeration. Mm -hmm. So when we start to see the patchy uh, uh, development of the B-lines and the curtain-like structure. In COVID-19, we typically see preserved areas of normal aeration, seeing the, the normal horizontal A-lines in between the curtain-like uh, white patches of, uh, of confluent B-lines. This is the meaning of the, um, the spared areas. And they are quite typical for non-cardiogenic situations. Yes. Yeah, they are typical for non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And uh, a question about uh, the blue protocol. Uh, 
um, uh, what do you think about uh, using the blue protocol uh, for patients with uh, COVID-19? Mm -hmm. So the, the blue protocol, of course, is a great protocol uh, for critically ill patients. It was introduced by Daniel Lichtenstein in uh, many years ago, almost now more than 20 years ago. Um, it's, a, it's a great uh, protocol, but the, uh, the aim of the blue protocol is the differential diagnosis of the cause of respiratory failure. Blue is for a blue patient. Okay, so in this case, we can use the blue protocol, but if we want to do the differential diagnosis of the, of the respiratory failure, in many of these patients, we have a different aim. Uh, we are in a pandemic situation. So patients coming with uh, typical symptoms here, we don't really want to do a differential diagnosis. We want just to check if the patient has a pulmonary involvement or not yes. and the degree of the pulmonary involvement. So if this is the aim, we should just check the abnormalities we have seen, the distribution and the pattern. Uh, the blue protocol is something more if in your patient you are not even sure that the cause of the respiratory failure is the COVID-19, but you have to differentiate if there is a cardiogenic pulmonary edema, a pneumothorax, a pulmonary embolism, or another, or, or another cause. So it's uh, so theology-centered. Yes, and we have yeah. a question in mind, so we try to answer the question in a short time. Uh, to try to get the answer. And maybe I, I will have a time for one final question. We won't have time to answer all these questions and we will answer them to you and send it in a supplement on the ASC website after the, the webinar. So um, one final question, Luna. Um, so do you think we can, uh, do you think we need to scan every COVID-19 patient with lung ultrasound? Oh, <laughs> this is another very difficult question. Uh, I mean, we need to know in every positive patient if there is a lung involvement. You can do this with different imaging techniques. We know that chest X-ray is very insensitive. So if you can do a chest CT to all patients, you don't need to do the lung ultrasound. Of course, the chest CT is much more accurate than the lung ultrasound. Usually we do a lung ultrasound because you can do it quicker than a chest CT. So you can have the information, do I have a pulmonary involvement in these COVID positive patients? Yes or no? This is quicker with the lung ultrasound. And it, it, it is also more repeatable at site because also the, the sanification issue is uh, less uh, crucial. I mean, it, it is um, even bigger for, for the CT. Uh, so I would mm. say as long as you need to, to know what's going on in the lung, Anytime you cannot do a CT, you, you can do a lung ultrasound, but you have always to keep in mind uh, this balance and it's not the substitution for, for the, C, for the CT. Definitely. It is something you can do in a different scenario. You can do it quicker and you can do more times. And safely as well, reducing the healthcare professionals exposed to the patient. Yeah. But of course, the CT is our reference for imaging the lung. This is... Uh, Without doubt. But for example, for home monitoring, you cannot do the CT, but you can do uh, a lung ultrasound. Great. That's great. So we reached the end of this uh, uh, questions and answers section, and now we are approaching the end of this webinar. And we would like to um, conclude by some take home messages. Um, we need to learn lung ultrasound and use it. So learn it, get trained, and it's not difficult to learn. Uh, so keep in mind the importance of lung ultrasound. Remember as well the COVID-19 typical lung ultrasound features, which would probably help you in your daily management. Larger studies and more evidence are needed. And remember the probe should not replace your brain, so use both. Be wary of infection transmission risk with the equipment and for yourself, and always use an integrated approach, not only the lung. So, dear colleagues, you can find the recordings of this webinar on the ESC website. And please stay, stay strong and, and safe. safe. And thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.